Thanks, Gary. Uh, good morning, everybody. I, I'll certainly talk about some mistakes that I've made myself and, and things that we can learn from what happens to these patients with severe ulcerative colitis. I will tell you that in, in addition to the mistakes I've made myself or witnessed myself, I figured I'd ask my friends and learn a little bit about what's going on uh, both nationally, globally, and, and importantly from some of the surgeons. So uh, Dr. Akotze, many people have seen at this meeting, and uh, Amy Leitner, who are surgeons, who really gave me some insight into how we can think through some of the mistakes. And certainly the surgeons have no problem pointing out our mistakes that, that we make in our practices. I, I did get uh, advice from some of my friends who are simply smart and are at great institutions and then some international expertise as well to really think through what's happening with patients, uh, pr primarily patients who are in the hospital who uh, are, are at high risk and have big stakes at risk when they're in the hospital when mistakes could be made. So let's just clarify and get on the same page of who we're talking about. If you look up definitions of severe ulcerative colitis, at least the most recent ACG guidelines define severe ulcerative colitis as having greater than or equal to six stools, signs of toxicity, and an elevated sedimentation rate. It's pretty close to what we call acute severe ulcerative colitis, which really comes from the true live wits criteria within the first 48 hours. So on admission, what are the characteristics that put you into this category? And early on, it's very similar. It's six or more bloody stools per day. Then they're more specific about toxicity. They talk about a pulse greater than 90, uh, a fever, a hemoglobin less than 10.5 grams per deciliter, or, and or a sedimentation rate greater than 30. And then to keep in mind why this is so important and why these patients are at such risk, great, if, if you have three or more of these criteria, there's a 50% risk of colectomy. So this is the group of patients that I focused on here where mistakes have such high stakes that we're talking about either life-threatening situations or surgery before they leave the hospital. And this is where we really need to be engaged and involved and in seeing our patients daily. If you're in an academic institution, not relying on the house staff to make decisions about when to pull the trigger on next therapies or when to bring the surgeons in. But we need very, very high engagement as specialists and guests neurology and inflammatory bowel disease. So I'll go through a list of, of mistakes, again, that I've been part of myself or, or seen or heard from my colleagues around the world. The first is make sure you're treating the right thing. And Susie brought this up. We, we want to make sure we're not being faked out by something else. Is this an infection like Clostridium difficile or C. diff infection or other acquired infections? Is this ischemia that can certainly look like acute severe ulcerative colitis? And although it seems crazy to get admitted to the hospital with functional bowel disease or anxiety, when you layer that on top of a history of ulcerative colitis, throw in a little bit of hemorrhoidal bleeding, all of a sudden anxiety gets very, very high. These patients can have a, get, have a low threshold sometimes, particularly if coming through the emergency department that this is a flare of their disease and get admitted. And before you know it, they could be on intravenous steroids and, and, and waiting to get better for a process that's not really acute, severe ulcerative colitis. The other part, and John Fred has done a very good job of teaching our field about this, that damage doesn't only happen in Crohn's disease. People with long-standing chronic ulcerative colitis also get damage to their colon. That can lead to stricturing. All strictures are not cancer. And can lead to dysmotility, anorectal dysfunction, and impaired permeability. And when you put all of that together, throw in maybe a viral infection or throw in again maybe some rectal bleeding, this can look like acute severe ulcerative colitis. You've seen these patients probably in your hospital who get admitted, you do a sigmoidoscopy and say, huh, it doesn't look that bad, what's, what's going on here? But you can get down the wrong path early if we don't initially question the diagnosis and make sure we're not missing something else or mistaking this for something else. We've talked about CMV and C. diff, but I'll re-emphasize this. This is so important and not something you want to figure out at the time of colectomy that this was an infection that was potentially treatable. It doesn't mean that these infections can't lead to colectomy without being treated appropriately or even if treated appropriately, but we need to recognize that steroid use, whether patients have been on it as an outpatient or an inpatient for a while, can increase that risk of CMV and C. diff infection. They're both associated with an increased rate of colectomy and unfortunately immortality, and it's important to check, a, check C. diff with every flare. I know we get a lot of stool tests for our patients when they call, a lot of stool tests when patients show up to the emergency room or the hospital. It could be eight times in a row that they have a negative C. diff, and then it comes back positive when they get admitted to the hospital, and you say to yourself, well, we checked this a few weeks ago, maybe we don't need to check it again, and we could make a big mistake in treating the wrong thing and the wrong reason they're in the hospital. And looking for CMV early, and I'll talk about sigmoidoscopy in just a minute. When you're doing sigmoidoscopy, 
ideally you're doing this at admission within the first 24 hours. And I always ask my lab to check the immunohistochemistry, or IHC, to, for, for CMV to, to check the sensitivity on biopsies. You can send it for CMV culture, and when your patient's long discharged and you're seeing them three weeks later, maybe those results will come back. Uh, you could also send whole blood PCR, but depending on the lab, it has widely varying test characteristics. So it's, it's hard to know when one of these tests come back positive for CMV, and whether that's an innocent bystander or really something significant. There was a nice piece of work from Cedar sinai a couple of years ago where they looked at when patients got better with treatment for CMV. And it was actually primarily when you saw it on H&E. If it's seen on H&E, that's probably a sign that this is clinically significant CMV and you should be treating it as opposed to wondering if this is a secondary infection or an innocent bystander on top of acute severe ulcerative colitis. So let's talk about getting started in the hospital and things that can happen and mistakes that can happen upon admission or early on. Well, the first thing is waiting too long to transfer the patient to a hospital that has an appropriate team or waiting too long to meet a surgeon. There are a lot of reasons that transfers get delayed. Either patients don't want to leave local hospitals, we all want to give steroids just a little bit longer, maybe another day or two or two or three days, then we'll see how things go. And by that time, you're already at day six, seven, or eight, and sometimes patients are being transferred to a center with a colorectal surgeon when you've missed that, that window before they get very, very sick. And bed availability, of course, is always a problem. If you have the appropriate team at your hospital, and many of you do, and then we have to remember that second line therapy, as Susie mentioned, the, the time you start thinking about that is at 72 hours, not after five days, six days, or seven days of intravenous steroids. It's within those first three days you understand which direction the patient's going to go. And surgical consultation early is very important. I always tell my patients, this doesn't mean I think you need a surgery right now. It means I want you to meet the surgeon and hear the options. And regardless of what happens at day three, that's when some big decisions are being made about improvement, toxicity, surgery, or second line medical therapy. And I think meeting your surgeon before you need surgery is always the best time to talk with them. And it's also important to have the stoma nurses come down. Ideally, your patient at some point in their history of ulcerative colitis would have, would have met one of the surgeons and learned a little bit more about their options before they got so sick. But if not, having that stoma nurse come down just to talk with them is extremely important because when they're sicker on day three, four, and five, and the surgeons are coming for the first time, it really makes it for a very, very difficult conversation. And when I asked my surgical colleagues or our surgical colleagues of mistakes that are made, this was the primary thing that they asked is they wished that the surgeons were involved earlier upon admission. The reason this is so important about either transfer to a hospital that does a lot of surgery for ulcerative colitis or not waiting too long is that mortality rates are affected by either being at a low volume place that doesn't do a lot of surgery for acute severe ulcerative colitis or waiting too long in the hospital. On that bottom graphic, you can see the number of preoperative admission days. This isn't going out to 20 days. This is simply going out to a week or, or, or 10 or 11 days. And you can see how mortality and morbidity creep up the longer you wait. So again, waiting till day seven, day 10 to think about surgery is simply too late for most of these patients. Susie brought this up about testing for tuberculosis. This is a practical issue that comes up in the hospital that before initiating biologic therapy, We've all taught ourselves that we need to check for tuberculosis and hepatitis B. Depending on your institution and your lab, it may not come back in time before you have to make decisions. I always send these tests or encourage that we send these tests right at admission so that ideally you do have the results back, but this should not delay therapy for most patients. It depends where you are in the country or in the world, at least in northern New England and New Hampshire, we have a very low rate of tuberculosis. So in our practice, we've become to feel comfortable with asking about risk factors, checking a chest x-ray, if we don't have our results back, we're giving biologic therapy if needed, regardless of what those results are. Again, it's different if they have risk factors or some concerning symptoms, but in my part of the world, at least, that's just not a problem, fortunately. This, gets, uh, this mistake gets made all the time. We'll find out that a patient gets admitted, you're waiting for the patient to prep, they feel too sick, they're having abdominal pain, they can't get down the prep, they're vomiting. They do not need a prep, they do not need a full colonoscopy, early and easy sigmoidoscopy. If you've scoped one of these patients, and I'm sure you have, who hasn't prepped at all, oftentimes their colons look pretty good because of the frequency of their stool. We're not looking for small serrated adenomas here. 
We're looking to get a sense of what the colon looks like, take biopsies for CMV, and get out of there. The value of trying to get all the way around in a very sick colon, the value of looking into the terminal ileum, although one can make an argument if you're thinking about surgery that it's important, this is not the time to do that. This is the time to understand how sick they are and if they have a concomitant infection that would change the way we're treating them. Deep ulcerations, by the way, on admission is a sign that you need second or third line therapy. That does not mean let's wait three or four days on steroids and, and see what happens. If somebody comes in with deep, nasty looking ulcers in their colon, we pull the trigger on second line therapy, typically biologic therapy, right away. This is a mistake that we've all made. I've certainly made this myself over time, just giving it a little bit more time on IV steroids and hoping that they're going to turn around. But remember, 30 to 40% of patients with acute severe ulcerative colitis will not turn around. IV steroids do not work for everybody. The, the, you shouldn't assume that they're going to get better if you just give it longer. The writing is on the wall after three or four days. The data would strongly suggest now, going back 20 to 30 years, that after that first three or four days, the natural history will not change if you give higher dose or, or longer steroids. All the prognostic scores that we use are within 24 hours or 72 to 96 hours, whether it's the true love, true love wits criteria, or all these other scoring systems. I'm not suggesting that you do all these scoring systems every time, but to remember that these scoring systems that dictate the course of disease are all done within the first few days. This is not something that's measured at one or two weeks later. And then again, to reiterate, giving higher dose steroids beyond 60 milligrams of methylprednisolone equivalent, which is 300 milligrams of hydrocortisone, giving it longer than seven to 10 days really buys you nothing other than getting your patient sicker and lower chance to respond to biologic therapies and a, difficult time, a, a more difficult time for your patient and for the surgeon. Waiting too long to give rescue therapy is the other mistake that's commonly made here. It's tied to that last slide. There are a number of reasons for this. We're hoping that steroids will kick in. Uh, the provider or the patient is uncomfortable using biologic therapy. The hospital may be resistant to, to give because of cost, and we know that it's a big loss in many cases and if you're giving uh, intravenous biologics in the hospital or you need approval from the hospital or worried about approval from the payer. Day three is when this assessment happens. And the criteria to give rescue therapy is based on the Oxford criteria. You can see at day three, that's greater than eight stools per day, or three to eight stools with the CRP greater than 45. Or if you have waited to day seven, which again is a little bit too long, greater than three stools per day are visible blood. And you can see there the PUKAI score for those pediatricians out there recognize that a, a PUKAI score of 65 on day five is time to give rescue therapy. When giving rescue therapy, we have to make sure we do it right, because taking a check swing in this situation and not really going for it, you may as well not give rescue therapy at all. The approved doses for biologics are for clinical trials based on outpatients with moderate to severely active ulcerative colitis. Those clinical trials and the FDA approvals were not based on these patients who are in the hospital and really sick. We know that a severe inflammatory state is associated with rapid metabolism or loss, in the, uh, 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 loss of protein from the colon. I'm sure you've seen this, but if you're checking therapeutic drug levels of, of a drug like infliximab in the hospital, even two or three days after a dose, the drug levels can be absolutely zero because the drug's getting either metabolized quickly or more often lost as protein in the colon. And you can actually measure infliximab levels in the colon that are higher in blood because of the stool loss and the, the drug simply not getting there. The risk factors for this are male gender, a high body weight, a low albumin, and a high CRP. If you're seeing that and your patient's not turning around, you either have to start with a higher dose at 10 milligrams per kilogram or rapidly give a second dose of another five milligrams per kilogram. You do not need to wait two weeks. This should be within a few days if your patient's not turning the corner, we think about giving a second dose if we gave five. Sometimes if we've given a 10 milligrams per kilogram dose, it's not unreasonable to think about giving another dose at a, at a high level at 10 milligrams per kilogram to really try to get your patient to turn the corner. But I think this is where one of the biggest mistakes are commonly made in the hospital, which is giving a single dose of five milligrams per kilogram, calling it a failure and calling in the surgeon, which might be needed, but I would say at that point they have not failed optimized medical. Medical therapy.
This is something that is practical and comes up, and I'm guessing many of you have been in the position that I have, which you've given your first dose of infliximab in the hospital, and the patient gets better, which is fantastic, and then very quickly, that second dose comes up, and you find out that your payer is calling you and denying that drug because that's not their first-line therapy, and they want to move to an injectable or some other drug as opposed to infliximab. Starting this conversation sooner than better is great. Waiting for the denial to come is often a problem because it comes a day or two before they're due for that dose and you really don't want to delay that second dose. They will ultimately agree. You need to get a medical director on the phone. You need to explain to them why it's so important that we don't give one dose of one of our, our, our most effective drugs for ulcerative colitis and then move on to something else. They oftentimes want you to move on to one of the injectable biologic drugs. And I would say never give up on this. Do not do it out of convenience. Do not do it because they're being a pain and pushing back about this. But you have to stick to your guns and, and fight for the patient here. And they should not be getting one dose of a biologic drug and then and moving on. This is something that comes up every so often if you're using cyclosporin at your institution is if we give cyclosporin or infliximab and they're failing, should we try the other drug as rescue therapy? And you can. It is a strategy that works and it's effective. You can see the response and remission rates here. The trouble is this is a fairly untested and risky scenario when it comes to large populations of patients. All these studies are pretty small, but you can see in all these studies there was a real mortality and morbidity rate when you're giving both of these medications. This might be because the patients are simply so sick that bad things happen to patients who are very, very sick, but it also could be that we're giving a lot of immune suppression to patients who are in the hospital. We intuitively think that if you start with cyclosporin and then turn it off, off. The half-life is so short that it's safe to give infliximab or another biologic drug as opposed to the other direction where you give a biologic drug and it hangs around for eight weeks and on top of that you're adding cyclosporin. But it, regardless of the direction of which drug you gave first, they still had bad outcomes. And this isn't something that we do in our practice, although it comes up. We have thought about it, and most places are not doing this. I'm sure some are in very high-risk patients who really don't want surgery, but at least in our hands, if you're failing this first-line rescue therapy of cyclosporin or infliximab, we're moving on to surgery after that. Again, that could be a matter of debate. Don't let bad things happen to your patients. We may have treated them perfectly well with the exact right time of IV steroids, giving medications at the exact right time. I'll just keep talking through this until you bring the slides up. But there's some other things that we have to think about with our patients. One is forgetting about DVT prophylaxis. With DVTs, this is, this is the shame of all shames. When a patient gets better, we forgot about DVT prophylaxis, they develop a DVT, and unfortunately, PEs do occur, and we know how serious those can be. There's a huge amount of variation in practice of giving DVT prophylaxis in the hospital. In fact, in one study, only 3% of hospitalized patients were giving any uh, uh, DVT prophylaxis. It is okay to use prophylactic heparin even if they have rectal bleeding, and this is oftentimes resistance that you don't want to give anything that could potentially cause them more bleeding, but it's a safe thing to do. Obviously, we keep an eye on them as we're doing this. We know that it's associated with post-hospitalization venous thromboembolic events by giving DVT prophylaxis. The thing that concerns me with this is the risk is most prominent during the first two months after discharge. And at least in my practice, we're not typically carrying over DVT prophylaxis after after hospitalization, but I do wonder if this is something that we should be thinking about more commonly. Preventing opportunistic infections, patients who are on triple immune suppression with corticosteroids oftentimes coming in from an outpatient on a thiopurine that's going to linger around for a while, and either a calcineurin inhibitor or an anti-TNF. We need to give them PJP prophylaxis, as although this is very rare, there's a significant mortality associated with PJP infection, intubation rates, ICU admissions. This is a place we don't want to make a mistake and don't want to forget about something that was easy enough to give back to them orally just three times a week. Another mistake that we oftentimes see in the hospital are starving our patient. It's compelling to make them NPO. It decreases their frequency of stools. Patient times often don't want to eat, but this is not evidence-based. And coming from a great review from Australia, a trained dietitian should assess the nutritional status of the patient. Enteral supplements should be introduced as required. There is no role for routine parenteral nutrition, and there is also no role for routine fasting of these patients. Rehydration is important. Enteral feeding and keeping up with supplements is important. And management of nutritional deficiencies is very important, but again, not fasting and starving your patient. 
thinking briefly about pain management. The primary management of pain in the hospital is control of their disease. We know this is difficult, but up to 70% of hospitalized UC patients receive narcotics, which might participate in megacolon, and we know are associated with not only mortality, but infectious risks. We can try tramadol and acetaminophen. We know to avoid NSAIDs. This is when our surgeons really have to be involved and see our patients daily as well. If you have persistent pain in the setting of ulcerative colitis, this probably represents transmural inflammation, and its persistence is probably is, is associated with the need for surgery. And then uh, trying to save a colon at the risk of a life is something we all have to think about very carefully as our patients get sicker and sicker, really don't want to have surgery, and we, we understand clearly why that would be the case. But patients who are, pr are pr progressing, persistently active towards toxic megacolon really need, an oper a new, really need an operation, and the treatment of this is surgery and nothing other than surgery. Finally, discharging your patient and timing for this, it's very easy for us to push our patients out of the hospital. There are no validated discharge criteria for hospitalized UC patients. We need to see that our patient is markedly improved. Ideally, we want less than three non-bloody bowel movements per day. We want patients to be able to take their outpatient medications. They need to be tolerating oral hydration and nutrition. To say that your patient's better because they've been NPO and starving for a few days and their bowel movements are down does not mean they're ready for surgery. They need to be tolerating a diet and still have criteria ready for discharge before they're scheduled and, and, and out. And they absolutely need a clinical follow-up scheduled before they go, which should be within the next uh, week or two to see how they're doing. So in summary, there are a lot of things that can go wrong with these patients. We've all made these, I certainly have. We need to involve our surgeons early. They should see them at the time of admission. Get your stoma nurses involved as well just to have the conversation. Make sure you're treating the right disease. Let's not get faked out by an infection or even severe motility disorders that can go along with long-standing ulcerative colitis. Very important to remember that it's unlikely to get any benefit at all from IV steroids beyond three to five days, and we should be thinking about second line or rescue therapy at that time, but please make sure we're giving it the right dose. Again, one dose of a biologic drug and then calling it a failure is not appropriate. We need to make sure we're optimizing these patients. Please remember to prevent complications. We can take great care of our patients' colitis and forget about these other bad things that can happen to them. And then our surgeons asked me to please remind all of us that surgery is not a failure for the treatment of ulcerative colitis, it's a treatment. Again, thank you for having me and appreciate the time.